Yo, what is up people and welcome to another video of the docker based development workflow for beginners. Um, this is part three. In part one and two we covered the basics. We used docker compose to bring up our development containers and we used four programming languages. We were able to uh, mount some source code into containers. We were able to compile and build and run code. And in this video, we're going to look, take a look at more advanced concepts of Docker. We're going to look at Docker image layering and multi-stage build so that we can do a little bit more than just having to go inside of a container image to do the compiling and run. We want to automate these things and build effective container images that we can use so we can just um, do Docker Compose build, we can do Docker Compose up, we can start up uh, production ready images and we can look at reducing the image size and we'll be taking a look at these features so that we can use them in more advanced debugging scenarios for development so let's get cracking <laughs> Right, so what is Docker image layering? Up until now, we've actually used image layering. We have a Docker file um, that we created, and this is for the four different programming languages. It's on GitHub, you can take a look. Um, there's a from statement in every one of those, and this forms layer one. So what Docker does is with the Docker file, it evaluates it line by line and statement by statement. We have a from statement here defining a base image where to start where our SDK is in. And when, when we do Docker Compose build or Docker build, um, Docker looks at this file and then every line becomes like it uses a hashing algorithm to give every line like a unique identifier. And that becomes a, a separate unique layer. So we have layer one. Then what we did is we we had like run and we installed our dependencies using pip npm go get or we sometimes in Docker in C sharp we use .NET restore. What that does is that gives us layer two. Now sequence here is everything because what happens is when we change the layer one, Docker will automatically rerun all the different layers to build it. It builds it from top down. So it's really important to do do things that you change often lower down in the Docker file. And we'll take a look at this in a little bit more advanced concept. So this is the Docker image that we have built in part one and two of, of the series so far. And what this allows us to do is we can then run this image as it is. This is the basic development environment and we can go inside. We mount our source code in and then we do um, the build. So whatever programming language build command we have to run and then we have to start our application manually. Now, if you take a look at this, this is not really an image we can deploy to production. It's good for development, but going to production, we we want to have to we want to build our code automatically we want to run our code automatically so what we're going to do in this video we're going to put a copy command inside the docker file to bring our source code in and that's going to form layer three and then what we're going to do is we're going to run the build statement or where it's minification whatever it is and that's going to bring us um, give us our assembly or whatever output the build produces as layer four and this is going to be um, our build or our development environment image. So we're going to automate some of that processes so that we don't have to manually go in, mount our code, run the build manually. We'll do all of this in the Docker file. What we've done up to this point is we created a development environment. For production, this is even not sufficient. We don't want the SDK and all the libraries in the production image unless we need them. So what we're going to be looking at as a concept called Docker multi-stage, where we can define stages and we can have like a dev stage and a production stage. So let's take a look at that. What it allows you to do, it gives each stage an alias and every alias is done with a from statement. So what we can do is we can give this from statement that we have over here an alias. And what that does is we can call it like from stage one. That's going to be the first stage and we can call this stage dev in our example. Now, when we say Docker compose build, we can actually pass in a target and we can say just build dev as a target and Docker will produce an image with just stage one. What we can then do is we'll expand our, our Docker image, um, our Docker file, and we'll say from another image. And this could be a, a trimmed down image without the SDK, or it can be an image that has like the runtime or whatever we need to run, the bare minimum to run our application. This will become layer five. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, 
Let's take the output from stage one. So any build artifacts we produce as part of stage one, we can we can copy into this new layer here with the copy command. And this will produce layer six. And then what we will do is we can then do a run um, statement. Um, in, in Docker, this would be like a, a command or an entry point where we would just start up our application. And that's layer seven. The beauty about these different stages is that we can introduce a lot of debugging tools and we can expose debugging ports as part of the development stage and then make sure that th those um, pieces of code don't end up in our production image. Anyway, what we do with this stage is then we define this as a production stage and that becomes stage two. So now we have a multi-stage image where we provide stage one as dev, stage two as prod. And this should be enough for us to make an effective production image. So let's take a look, a close look at our Docker file and you will see that it did not change much. We used to have a build line. Now I've expanded that into having a context line. So context is where is our source code. So I have my source in the C sharp folder and then I have a target for dev and we can have it. We can have a target for dev and prod and I've defined these inside the Docker file, which I'll show you shortly. And that's kind of all that changed. We still have all these other things. Um, that we had in part one and two and if i go down let's look, take a look at the golang image it's the same we also have the context and the target for the node.js image we have the context also target as dev and for python we have the target and the context so let's take a quick run through all the programming languages this is the c sharp image we have our first stage as the SDK look at this I said as dev every stage has that's how you define the the alias of the stage so I said this is going to be the dev stage so basically everything in this from statement all the way to the end until the next from statement will become dev and then we start a new image um, which is they're going to be the runtime and that's going to be prod so everything after will be the production stage. I have the SDK. I create just a working directory called app. I want to do everything inside app for some reason. I just define you can use any folder name. I copy my source from outside. Um, and what I'm going to do here, remember that Docker evaluates this file line by line. So in this one, to do an effective build, I don't want to do .NET restore and pull my dependencies every time I build. So I'm going to copy in the project file only, not the whole source, because remember the source code will always change as I'm developing. So I don't want to have this file change often unless I'm adding a dependency. So I copy this file in, I then do .NET restore. Docker will look at this line by line. It'll go, okay, cool. Um, this The project file might have changed, so it's going to run a .NET restore. If I don't pull any dependencies, it's not going to reevaluate um, and or rerun the .NET restore again. It'll reevaluate, but it'll see there's nothing um, changed. So that'll make our builds really fast. Then what we do is we copy the remaining source files into the app, um, app folder. And then we make an output folder and then we just say .NET publish into the output folder. And yeah, so we have our dev image with a binary that we can now run. Then what we do is we define the runtime image, which is a much smaller image than the actual SDK image. And then we say this is going to be our production. What we then do is we do similarly create a app um, folder, set that as working directory. And here we copy the binaries from the output into the app folder. So we bring everything out. We give execution rights on that folder so that we can start the, the DLL. Um, we don't need this. I'm just listing out all the files and we do our command, which says .NET work DLL. So this is going to be our like application assembly. In the previous video, we used to um, do this manually by mounting the source code in and then we used to manually go in and do .NET build or .NET publish. And then we had to manually say .NET and run it. Now this is all automated. We have two targets. One, we can start up. If we want to do debugging, we start up the dev target. If we want to do testing on a production image, we start up the production target or the, the prod target. 
Now let's take a look at Golang. So Golang, we also pull the SDK. We define it as a dev stage. We then do all these things like we install Git and then we do go get to get all our dependencies. Create a working directory called slash work. We copy our source code in and we say go build. And that produces our static compiled um, binary called app. Then we start a new image, which is a tiny Alpine image. It doesn't have the SDK, it's really small. And then we say as prod, so we alias that one, and we simply copy out from the dev layer, we copy out the app binary into the production image. We're just copying it into the root of the image. And then we have this command to start it up. So very basic, very basic concept, um, but this is multi-stage for Golang. Let's take a look what I did with Node.js. I said from the Node 12 image as dev, so we create our alias once again. We create our app folder and we set it to working directory. Now, this is where the magic happens. We don't wanna do npm install every time the source code changes and a lot of people make this mistake and their builds are really slow. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy the package.json file into the image first. Uh, because this one is the only file that'll change if we pull in new dependencies and that's when we want to run npn install so we run the install command straight after remember docker makes a layer for every one of these statements it makes a layer from run work directory copy and run here and what will happen now is we'll have uh, one two three four five layers and if package.json changes docker will come back to this layer reevaluate notice that it changed and it will do, it'll copy this file into the image again and run npm install and run everything below that again. So that's why I've done it like this, so that we can build effective images. And then what we're gonna do after that is copy in the remainder of our source into app, and we're gonna start a new, a new layer. So what I said here is I just said from dev as prod, because we're gonna need all the stuff we installed from the dev image as well. Now, our production image is not gonna be very different. So in this case, I just said from dev as prod, and the only difference that the production image has is it will automatically run um, our node command and start up our app, and that'll start up our web server. And finally, let's take a look at Python. So you can actually see that the layers are here, similar to the, um, to the Node.js, they might seem a little bit redundant. That is because we're producing the same thing in both layers. We're creating a dev, la a dev layer, we're starting our um, Python with Python on Alpine as a dev layer. We create our app folder and working directory. Now, similarly to all the other languages, we copy in this requirement.txt file and that file basically just says we want Flask and a specific version of our dependency. And then what we do after that is we say pip install and we point it to that requirements.txt. Now, remember again, based on the Docker multi-stage and the layerings of uh, sequence, this file will never change unless we actually physically change one of our dependencies. So um, Docker will evaluate this again from top to bottom and it'll build effectively and it won't rerun pip install ever unless the requirements change. So that's why we kind of do that. We take advantage of the, of the layering and then we copy in the remainder of the source and that's our development image. Now the production image is almost identical. We're just gonna call it prod. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy everything out of the dev layer that's been um, installed. And this one here, we're just gonna set an environment variable and start Flask up. That's the only major difference here. But when we're looking at advanced debugging concepts, it's good to, cr to create this little separation because we're gonna pull a lot of debug uh, dependencies into the dev layer. So that's why I've, I've kind of kept them separate here to show you guys the multi-stage feature. So what have we done in this video so far? We've taken a look at effective layering and using layering to make our builds more effective so that we don't rebuild unnecessarily we've taken a look at multi-stage build and this was to also make our builds more effective so that builds faster also keeps our production images small as possible and not include things that we don't want to include in the production image this will also in allow us for future video to do advanced debugging because in advanced debugging we're going to be taking debugging tools and adding it to our dev layer and we want to make sure we don't add these things to the production image so that's why this video is quite important to understand these fundamentals so therefore in the next video what i'm planning on doing is making separate guides for separate programming languages 
because they are vastly different. A lot of the programming languages have really good community built debugging tools um, and also for like auto reloading code. So a lot of the time you want to make a change, you're busy on a bug, you have a debugger attached, you want to make a change to code. You don't want to have to go out of the container, rebuild the whole container image and then start it back up, which is something a lot of people get, you know, um, stuck on when they start doing um, Docker based development. And you don't have to, if you use tools, you can automatically reload the code and start your, your process up and down without having to go out of the container and restart start the whole thing so we'll be looking at that but because each programming language is very different um, we'll probably slice it up and dive into each language separately um, so folks who are interested in python can focus purely on python and um, go c sharp and node.js so we'll do that separately so yeah thanks guys hope you enjoy this video hope it helps um, yeah stay tuned for the next one like and subscribe let me know down in the comments what you guys think and yeah give me any pointers on things you want me to focus on because this is kind of um, a free and open you know i'm just kind of winging it where i feel i can add the most value so let me know down in the comments and give some feedback and we can steer the ship in the direction you guys feel um, it'll provide more value so yeah see you in the next one peace, peace.